The golden question. The age-old question. The golden age question. Do the Nicktoons have one? The answer is an entirely subjective matter of taste in one aspect, and a science that can be pinpointed in another. The golden age of a singular entity is totally different from the golden age of a whole medium. Usually, the singular entity golden age is just the period in which the fans and critics think the quality is at its highest. There's a bunch of videos on that discussion with just The Simpsons alone, I don't want to step on anyone's toes. What I'm interested in is the golden age of entire mediums. The golden age of comic books, science fiction, Hollywood, animation. It means the period in which our current basic perception of the medium is crystallized. It may have been around before, but this is where the most important characters debuted, or the medium became ingrained in the mainstream. A golden age ends, or a silver age begins, due to no one similar factor. It could be when more works of a different variety are released. It could be when one important series ends or another begins. It could be when most of the golden age pioneers begin to retire. And just because silver is less valuable than gold in real life, doesn't mean Silver Age works are always considered worse than what came before. A lot of people prefer Silver Age comics to Golden Age ones. It just means we're in a new generation of art where the foundation has been built already. This is simultaneously an easier and harder discussion to have with Nickelodeon than its main rivals, Cartoon Network and Disney Television Animation because the former's eras are usually signified by on-air branding, and the latter's by where the shows are playing. That makes it easier to say what show comes from this or that era, but also harder to name a golden age because it's even more dependent on subjectivity. With Nickelodeon, the on-air branding changes too frequently to house whole eras between every refresh, and while they eventually move to the Nicktoons network, a majority of Nicktoons are produced with the intent of airing on the main channel first. The Nicktoons have a long and detailed history, so to catch you up to speed for the next portion of the video, here's a sampler of it. Nickelodeon is launched. It starts playing cartoons, but not their own, acquired programming from other places. Nickelodeon's first animated special is Christmas in Tattertown. Their second animated special is Nick's Thanksgiving Fest. This is also the year where Geraldine Laybourne and Vanessa Coffey organize a program to produce pilots for original animated series. This is where the commonly considered history of the Nicktoons begins. Games Animation is founded as a place to co-produce the new cartoons, three of which have been picked by the end of the year. The first three shows premiere on August 11th, Doug, Rugrats, and The Ren and Stimpy Show. John Kay, the now infamous creator of Ren and Stimpy, is fired, and Games takes over all production from John's company, Spumco. The first new Nicktoon, Rocco's Modern Life, premieres on September 18th. The second new Nicktoon, Ariel Monsters, premieres in October. Nothing really. Herb Scannell succeeds Geraldine Laybourne as Nick's president, and has a lot to deal with. Doug gets pushed by Disney, Rugrats gets revived with new writers, and Hey Arnold and Kablam are added to the roster in October. The Angry Beavers premieres in April, and Herb invests $350 million into Nicktoon plans for the next five years starting in June. A new studio is opened in Burbank to replace games in March, and three new shows premiere in April, July, and September. The middle one being a showcase of new talent and Nicktoon ideas. The company's first animated movie, the Rugrats movie, is released in theaters in November. Star. SpongeBob in May, Rocket Power in August. Now, the 90s are often remembered as the golden age of Nickelodeon in general, when it was most focused on its creative goals to give kids a messy and silly viewing experience but it was a very different channel by the time they were airing Rocket Power, so I don't think I'd consider all of these shows to come from the same exact age. Whether the cutoff is Geraldine Laybourne leaving, the shutting down of games, the Rugrats movie, the premiere of Spongebob, or the point at dethroned Rugrats as their most popular show, there's a lot of potential cutoff points between the Golden and Silver Age that point to Nickelodeon expanding their production outward from their humble beginnings. Heck, I've even seen the argument that the first three Nicktoons are the only Golden Age ones, and it had already ended by the time Rocco came around. For me, the cutoff is Herb's $350 million investment in animation, which meant they could produce a lot more shows with a lot more episodes. 
Around June, they would have greenlit CatDog for a full series, begun animating this offbeat Spongeboy Ahoy pilot, and started recruiting talent for Oh Yeah cartoons. No matter what you think of these shows, they were the start of an influx of new resources and opportunities. And to reiterate, I'm not saying they're worse just because they're part of a Silver Age, just that the structure of Nicktoon production and release had changed substantially enough that this is a new era for them. I realize that with this cutoff point, the Angry Beavers would mark the end of the Golden Age. That could put a lot of pressure on it to cap things off, but I don't want that for it. It's a fun show that was cut short by the company's shifting management not being so responsive to their tongue-in-cheek ways. There's also the temptation to lump it in with CatDog and Spongebob as part of the late 90s funny animal trinity, but again, it started under a pretty different attitude around Nicktoons. Now that I've given you a good idea of when I think the Silver Age begins, when does it end? I mean, the era that gave you Spongebob and the Fairly Odd Parents has some significance too. If you remember the thumbnail, you'd know I want a full set of loons, dimes, and pennies by the end of this video, so here's a quick 2000s Nicktoons history as a refresher. As told by Ginger in October, then another Rugrats movie in November. The Fairly Odd Parents and Invader Zim premiere on the same day in March. One has more long-term success than the other. The Rugrats special, All Growed Up, becomes their most watched broadcast of all time in July. The Jimmy Neutron movie premieres in December after a very full year of promotion. Jimmy Neutron gets a show in July, following Chalk Zone in March. Two more movie adaptations of Nicktoons release to less success, and Nicktoons TV launches as its own channel in May. All Grown Up, the first fully-fledged Nicktoon spin-off, premieres in April, followed by My Life as a Teenage Robot in August. Rugrats Go Wild also comes out in June, completing the Rugrats film trilogy. Danny Phantom premieres in April, then the SpongeBob SquarePants movie is released in November, marking a turning point for the network's biggest franchise. Avatar The Last Airbender, Cat Scratch and The X's premiere in February, July, and November respectively, the latter two being the first Nicktoons to end at one season. Saimazar Gami replaces Herb Scannell as Nickelodeon's president, Barnyard is released in theatres in August, but no new cartoons are made for the main channel for the first time since 1995. Maybe Kappa Mikey, but that was more at home on the Nicktoons network. El Tigre, Tack and the Power of Juju, and Back at the Barnyard premiere in February, August, and September respectively. The middle one is an adaptation of the video game series by THQ. It's become increasingly common for new Nicktoons to only last a season and or get burnt off on the Nicktoons network. SpongeBob achieves its highest viewership ever with the special Atlanta Square Pantis in November. After being cancelled in 2006, The Fairly Odd Parents is revived in February. Five new cartoons are planned to air on the main channel, the most in the network's history up to now, but many of them are short-lived, co-productions, or don't even air on the main channel. Ahead of Fanboy and Chum Chum's premiere in November, the Nickelodeon splash is retired in September, making way for a much flatter and less creative logo. No arguing that a Golden Age and even Silver Age is long past. A cutoff for this era is pretty obvious. Avatar The Last Airbender. I see this as the most common sort of cutoff point for Nicktoon historians, shows. I didn't bring it up for the Golden Age because the collective style and impact of the output changed very slowly, but with the Silver Age, there's such a stark contrast between Avatar and Cat Scratch that you can't ignore it. Not in quality, I like Cat Scratch, but success rate. Avatar remains the most critically acclaimed Nicktoon of all time, with only SpongeBob being a contender, and its popularity has continued for generations. Cat Scratch, on the other hand, only stuck around for a year and a half, and is little more than a footnote in animation history these days. A couple little things happened in 2005 and 2006 that would make good cutoff points if you weren't going by shows. The closing of Nickelodeon Studios at Universal in April, not that it had much impact on Nicktoon production. The post-movie era of Spongebob beginning in May, the most popular show in what started as a creator-driven initiative, now continuing without its creator's complete involvement, Saima Zagami becoming the network's president in January 06, making some frankly patronizing comments about Spongebob later that year, the production of their next showcase show, Random Cartoons, going very well then getting burnt off and under-promoted three years late. 
I think the way they treated random cartoons also says a lot about the shift the network had gone through. Oh yeah, cartoons had a big impact on their programming in the early 2000s. It gave them more talent and ideas than they could ask for. So them not seeming to care about its successor slash fourth season tells us they weren't willing to go through with the same priorities as in the Silver Age. I was almost considering starting the Bronze Age with Danny Phantom or Avatar, but they were in active pre-production within the five year investment period Herb Scannell had blocked out in 1997. And Danny Phantom, despite not being created for the project, was still by and large a product of Oye Cartoon's alumni. In fact, it was the first Nicktoon of the 2000s to be thought up in the 2000s. They had so much prep time in that era. But the Bronze Age is still full of interesting stuff. El Tigre was ambitious artistically and narratively. Back at the Barnyard has its charm, I promise. Tack and Penguins are some of the studio's first co-productions with other companies, so while maybe not official Nicktoons to some, they planted seeds for the more franchise-driven culture of the current Nicktoon lineage. But when does the Bronze Age end? When do we get to modern Nicktoons? Well, I don't want to be a judge of them, because I'm not an expert on what they're doing currently, but I think the Bronze Age has to end in 2009, hasn't it? The new logo changed so much. And even though it premiered after the logo change, I would say the era closed out with Fanboy and Chum Chum, due to it being a spin-off of Random Cartoons, its lasting legacy on Nickelodeon heading into the 2010s. Perhaps not on the channel it left the strongest legacy, but that's a video for another day. And that's all I have to say. I believe I've covered enough Nicktoons on this channel already to have an informed opinion on both subjects, but it's not like my words will be set in stone. This is probably the video I want you guys to disagree with me on the most. I hope a consensus can be reached someday, but at the moment, subjective takes are gonna be fun to read. I realize now that it's over that this take on Nicktoons ages is heavily tied around Oh Yeah cartoons and what it represented, but everything has its own importance to everyone, so type away and have fun.